Uh, this first reading uh, uh, will finish out where we were uh, in our study of the life of the Messiah in the section of his authority to heal. Uh, we will be dealing with the discussion is the healing in the atonement. In other words, is healing guaranteed? And then the next section uh, will carry us into uh, the Messiah's authority to preach. Remember, we have seen his authority over the spirit world, the demonic, his authority uh, to heal. And then we'll be moving into his authority to preach today. Bruce? If you have the harmony of the gospel, it's easier to follow along because you just flip a page. If you don't have it and you want it, let me know. I can print you one. But if you don't have it, we're going to be in Matthew 8. Beginning with chapter, chapter 8, beginning with verse 14. I'm sorry, verse 16. Just stand your ground, bro. Stand your ground. Yeah. I'll lean. I don't care. Matthew 8, 16. And my eye just... When evening came, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were, who were ill. This was to fulfill that was... That was spoken, that fulfilled what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. Now we're going to flip over to, this is under Messiah's authority to preach. We're going to flip over to Matthew 4. Matthew 4, beginning with verse 23. Jesus was going throughout all, all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. The news about him spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all who were, who were ill, those suffering from various diseases and pains, demon, demoniacs, demoniacs. Elip, elip, <laughs> epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. And then the last place we're going to be is over in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 42. When the day when day came, Jesus left and went to a secluded place, and the crowds were searching for him, and came to him and tried to keep him from going away from them. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. So he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. And all God's people said... It's always amazing how people will try and take scripture and twist it to say and mean things that it does not say and it does not mean. One of those scriptures that has led people down that path comes from the uh, Matthew 8 uh, passage where it says in verse 17 this was to fulfill that which was spoken through Isaiah the prophet which is Isaiah 53 4 he himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases um, that's the focus of what we want to wind up that section on because some people teach that by the death and payment of sin of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, that if you have enough faith, then you are guaranteed to be healed. 
You can be physically healed. And all who are truly saved, I put quotes around it, can claim healing today. That is, starting a little over 100 years ago, one of the main teachings coming out of the Pentecostal charismatic movement. That teaching says that a believer never has to be sick and that if you have enough faith, you can be healed of anything and everything. Healing is guaranteed, they teach, by the sufferings of Christ. And healing and health is simply given on the base, basis of the quality of the believer's faith. Usually hand in hand with that is the teaching of wealth. And that is, if you have enough faith, you will not be poor. You will be wealthy. And if you don't have enough money, it's because you don't have enough faith. And of course, that's usually when they'll say, well, what you have to do is have enough faith to send us and our ministry a large offering, and then God will give you back tenfold. <laughs> Health. You know, at the time that Jesus was here, there were a lot of sick people. There were sick people before he got here. There's been sick people after he got here. Now, let me just ask you a, a couple of questions before we talk about this just a little bit more. Um, can God heal if he chooses to heal? Absolutely. Could the Lord Jesus Christ, while he was on, here on earth, heal anybody he wanted to heal? Then why didn't he heal everybody in the entire world with a word? because he could have yeah. why didn't he because it was not in his purpose and plan that type of healing will be seen in the millennial kingdom so these are snapshots of the millennial kingdom remember he is coming to offer Israel the fact that he is the messianic king and that the kingdom was being offered to them if they had as a nation accepted him as the messiah the millennium kingdom would have come but god of course knew that it was not going to because he's god and we're not he knew that the way path was going to go but listen just because the lord knows these things just because it was being offered and he knew they were going to reject not only the kingdom but the messiah uh does not mean that it limited God in any way. But God will not violate the free will of mankind. And in his, in his omniscience, he already knows how people are going to respond. So in as far as the passage is concerned, Matthew 53 is describing the fact of spiritual healing from sin through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, through the atonement. It's not talking about physical healing. Uh, in other words, the results of the Messiah's death in Isaiah 53 would be spiritual healing. Now, it's interesting because at this time, now just stop and think with me. It, is it true that at this time, Jesus had already been to the cross, died, and resurrected at this, at this passage here in Matthew 8. Go like this. No, of course not. So what Matthew recorded happened well before Yeshua died, well before he made it the atonement for sin on the cross. Therefore, the passage cannot believe that all believers would automatically be healed because of the atonement. As a matter of fact, Matthew and the others didn't even believe that that was in God's plan. But if you remember how the New Testament writers quote the Old Testament, we did that study way back towards the very beginning. If you don't remember it, go back and find it. And it's in your Life of the Messiah studies yourself. One of the points is that it will be literal plus 
application. In this case, there is one point of similarity in what the prophet Isaiah says, and the passage is then applied to the situation described by Matthew. It was not meant to be taken as anything to do with a promise of healing that was going to come as a result of the work of Christ on the cross. But what Matthew was saying, using that principle of application, that what Isaiah said um, uh, to the to, uh, to in talking about spiritual healing was being applied to physical healing accomplished by Yeshua in this public ministry. It is simply an application of a truth from the Old Testament. He healed many as a demonstration and a validation of the fact that he was the promised Messiah and that his message was God's words. As a matter of fact, he was God himself come in human flesh and that the kingdom offer was on the table to national Israel. It doesn't mean that the work of Jesus Christ on the cross guarantees physical healing in this life now at all. Some people want to say, and if you go to Isaiah 53, uh, 7, you'll see by his stripes we are healed. Notice that Matthew does not mention anything about stripes or wounds. He simply states that Jesus took these things for us. He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Uh, he, and he carried away our diseases, the, the New American Standard. Now, you can get a lot more information about this Pentecostal idea by simply going to our spiritual gift study part two and there we dealt with it in depth um, now here's another question how many of you know that there are people alive today that had so much faith that they were there during the ministry of jesus christ and they're still alive anybody know anybody like that does anybody here know anybody that's at least 500 years old? I'm talking about in natural human life. Uh, okay, how about 250 years? 150. Huh. Does that mean nobody has enough faith or there's a fault with the doctrine? Where are the apostles? They all died. Didn't they have enough faith? Many of the faith healers, matter of fact, all of the faith healers that started all of that movement, guess where they are? Dead. As a matter of fact, some of them who were well-known healers, <laughs> including one who was a, I can't remember her name right now. I should, I should have looked it up. Catherine but Coleman. Catherine Coleman, there she is would even enter the stage flying in like an angel because she was bringing healing to everybody. Uh, she's dead. You know, you know how many people have been devastated and harmed by that teaching? Yeah. Yeah. That if there is a problem as to why your mama died, it's because you didn't have enough faith or she didn't have enough faith. Um, those are the kind of things that make me want to pick up a, a physical ball bat and see if I can practice their head with making a home run out of it. And I know it'd be a home run because I'm going to send them to their home, whether it's heaven or hell, I don't know. But if they don't believe in Christ for eternal life, I know where they're going. Okay. <laughs> Listen, and the reality is of the kingdom as we have seen, there will be a great restoration of health. In the eternal kingdom of the new heavens and the new earth, we looked at this last time, when there's going to be a human population that's going to continue to grow, Isaiah 9, 7, of the increase of his kingdom, there will be no end. And whatever injuries or illnesses are there going to be, it will be healed, either by the Messiah himself or by the leaves of the tree of life. There will be no sin and no physical death in the eternal kingdom, there is in the millennium, but not in the eternal kingdom. But that doesn't mean that somebody's not going to be, you know, running through the briar patch and cut their foot. 
you know, we get a little silly with the human beings I'm talking about, not the immortals, but those, well, of course, we're all human beings, not the immortals, but the mortals, those who do not have the, the either glorified body or a uh, resurrected body. So the immortals in the kingdom will have spiritual, immortal, incorruptible bodies. They'll never know disease or death. Uh, whenever we get home, that's the end of all of that. Praise God. We can and should pray for the sick, but there's no guarantee that you're going to get a positive answer based upon your faith or based upon anything else or based upon some healer in a white suit walking around blowing on you. If you don't know who I'm talking about, that's okay. That's right. Henny Penny. Benny Hinn. <laughs> Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Dealing now with the Messiah's authority to preach. Matthew 4, 23 to 25. Let's just look at begin at 23. Uh, Jesus is going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. The gospel of the kingdom. All right, here is true false. The gospel of the kingdom is what you have to believe in order to receive eternal life. True or false? Very good theologians. The gospel of the kingdom is used 51 times in Matthew, and it's a major theme in the book of Matthew where he is presenting his theme is Jesus is the Messiah. The gospel of the kingdom is the good news of the coming messianic kingdom and of the possibility of inheriting the kingdom. Twofold things. The, come, the promise of the coming messianic kingdom and the possibility of inheriting the kingdom or the right to rule with the Messiah. There's two aspects to that that can be seen in Matthew if you're paying very close attention. And that is, there is the, the earthly kingdom and the heavenly aspects of the kingdom. We'll be seeing those things as we go along. The earthly aspect of the kingdom is promised and guaranteed by the Abrahamic covenant and cannot ever be violated. But the heavenly aspect of the kingdom is something different. And we will note that as we go on. Uh, but the gospel of the kingdom is focused first and foremost on that millennial kingdom. It will, of course, go on into eternity. But the gospel of the kingdom, therefore, is going to be preached all the way through to the end of the tribulation period. You're in Matthew. Go to Matthew 24. Do I hear pages turning or just people planning to read scripture off my face? Matthew 24, 14. Jesus in Matthew 24 is talking about the tribulation period. And then he says in verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. You realize that even though we have the great omission, I mean the great commission to evangelize the world, that that will never be complete until the tribulation period. During the tribulation period, the 144,000, as well as other believers, will be tasked with the fact that every, every, Nation and tribe and tongue will hear the truth. Now, the entry into the kingdom of John 3.3, 3, unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of God, is, of course, the, necessi the, the necessary first aspect of the gospel of the kingdom. But the gospel of the kingdom is far broader and far more inclusive because what will be preached during the tribulation period is what? The king is coming. 
the king is coming. There's going to be the kingdom on the earth. And yes, it doesn't matter how terrible the tribulation times come. The Lord just says, stay faithful. I'm coming. And in his time, in his way, he's going to. And of course, the trigger for that is the national repentance of Israel. That will inaugurate the second coming. And that's at the very end of the tribulation period. The end, which is summarizes or ends with the campaign of Armageddon. But the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations. So that is the gospel of the kingdom. It includes, of course, like I said, you, you have to receive eternal life to enter the kingdom. It can be called the gospel of grace in Acts 20, 24. Uh, but it's far more than that. It has all the reward dimensions of the kingdom and all of that that we have studied. Um, We've also studied the fact that Jesus, as well as John the Baptist, pray, preached repentance by Jesus. When he preached repentance, was he saying, you have to feel sorry for your sins, turn from your sins, do other things to receive the free gift of eternal life? Go like this. No. So what was the repentance in association with the kingdom? It's simple, speaking this to the Jewish people. Change the way you think and act. Turn from your sin so that you can inherit the kingdom. You can inherit the kingdom. That's the thrust of it. The repentance never had anything to do with the entry into the kingdom. But it did have to do with, and still does, inheriting the kingdom. Matthew 4, 23 to 25, it says, Jesus went throughout all Galilee, verse 24, uh, um, they, it, the news about him spread through all Syria. And 25, large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. So let's just analyze what we see. The first thing is it says that he went teaching mainly in the synagogues. That's the first note. So who... We're in the synagogues. Jewish people. <laughs> okay. The content. What was the content of what he was preaching? 23. The gospel of the kingdom. He was not preaching that he died for their sins because that had not happened yet. He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom and himself as the king. Of course, in that process, we know from the Gospel of John, he always pointed to himself and said, believe in me and I'll give you everlasting life. And while that provides the entry into the kingdom, that is not the totality by any means of the gospel of the kingdom. And then how did he authenticate himself? Well, it says in 23 that he was healing all manner of diseases and all manner of sickness among the people. And in and in the, in the Mark passage that we didn't read, uh, it says he was casting out the demons. What was he doing? He was validating himself as the Messiah. It's as simple as that. Um, we find in, well, let's, let's go, over, go over to Mark real quick. Mark chapter one. Is Mark right after Matthew? Huh. Well, I'll get there eventually. Matthew, stop writing so much. Okay. Wow, Mark, there we go. Mark it down. Mark 1, 38 and 39. Mark 1, 38 and 39. He said to them, Jesus speaking, let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. And he went into their synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out the demons. So he was going from town to town, city to city, synagogue to synagogue, proclaiming himself to be the messianic king, validating that, validating himself and his message by the miracles that he was performing. Um, he, he was taking out his preaching tour, his really his second preaching tour. And it says in back in Matthew again, that the news about him spread throughout all Syria. Um, 
And in verse 25, this is interesting. Uh, it says, large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, as well as Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. In other words, his reputation was spreading on both sides of the Jordan River, on both sides of the Sea of Galilee. I'll show you a map in a second. There's people that want to say, well, Jesus is just a local rabbi, wasn't well known. The scripture says quite the opposite. Uh, there was a, a the, the first Jesus movement <laughs> was happening and people were paying attention um, across the board. And as a result of that, that preaching tour, people were being healed of diseases, torments from demons, those possessed by demons, epilepsy, palsy, and he healed all of them. This is a map. If you look, that blue, smaller uh, body of water that's on the map is the Sea of Galilee. That is the Jordan River that's running down through there. On the right-hand side of the map, uh, in uh, uh, in black, and all of the things that are in black, those are, that is the Decapolis. The Decapolis uh, was 10 Greek cities, mostly Gentile, none of which were in the Transjordan, the other side of the Jordan. The Synthopolis was just almost there, but it was on the left side of the Jordan. They had Jewish minority populations um, but it, what he's saying is that even the Gentiles were hearing about all of the things that Jesus was saying and doing, and they began to follow him. And it's interesting because if you were to, to uh, go uh, across the Jordan over into the Decapolis area, you'd find that they would eat different food. Matter of fact, they'd eat pork. We know that because... Later on, Jesus is going to cast out a demons out of a man, and they're going to run into a herd of swine. That happens over in the Decapolis area, on the opposite side. Um, also during Shabbat, on the left side of the uh, Jordan, or the west side of the Jordan, um, you, would not, you would not be working on Shabbat. But on the east side, you would be working on Shabbat. That was the Greco-Roman world, and one of the things of the... One of the things that, that was tempting to the Jewish people and also what many of the Gentiles were trying to prove was that their Greco-Roman world with their gods was greater than that of the Jewish people. Uh, this is just a picture of the Decapolis. Um, this is in the territory of um, it's a town called Hippos or a city of the Decapolis. Uh, it was located on the hill that's right in this, more or less in the center of that photograph out there in the distance. Um, Jesus didn't direct his ministry toward the Gentiles, but they were curious. They heard about him and many began to follow him. And with that, we can make the assumption that many came to faith in him. Uh, another city of the Decapolis um, was Gadara by the Sea of Galilee. This is where the demon-possessed man lived in the region of Gadara. We'll see that when we get to Matthew 8, 28. Um, it was here that, that this, these Gentiles uh, got mad at Jesus because he had all their pigs, <laughs> or, or the demons drove all the, jumped, over the, jumped over the cliff. And uh, do it? Okay. It's the first case of deviled ham. But the, the pigs, the pigs ran over the cliff. So it's the first known case of animal suicide. All right. Uh, yes, if they ran over eggs, we'd have deviled eggs. There we go. Oh my goodness. So this is a, one of the main streets in Dagara, in, uh, in Gadara. Um, Mark and Luke tell us that, that early the next morning after what was going on here in this passage that um, in verse chapter 5, verse 1, Matthew 5, verse 1, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain and went up on the mountain. He began to teach. 
But we also find out from Mark and Luke that he went off to pray first. He went off to pray first. He needed a time of peace and quiet from the crowds, a time with the Father to prepare for the next phase of his ministry. There it is. Um, which ought to tell us about the importance of prayer and ministry. Uh, anytime, anytime that we are engaged in any ministry aspects at all, we need to be sure and cover it with prayer. Mm -hmm. um, as a church, we need to be praying for each other and for this church and our time coming together before you get to church in the morning. Mm -hmm. I want to encourage you to do that and request that you do and pray for your pastors. I pray for the, the children's ministry and the teachers downstairs um, because without him, we can do nothing. If we do things in the energy of the flesh, we are wasting our time. And Jesus needed to talk to the Father. Guess what? We really need to talk to the Father. The apostles found him, and he told them they would not remain in Capernaum, but to go simply from city to city, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. In Mark one thirty-eight, you can find uh, that passage. All right, we're out of time this morning. Uh, we will pick up next time in the Messiah's authority over nature, and uh, then uh, we'll continue in the the life of the Messiah until we uh, until we get all caught up with where where uh, we need to be. And I have a lot of work to do to get ready for the next section. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you uh, for this time around your Word. Thank you for the truths that we see of our Lord Jesus Christ and his ministry. Thank you, Lord, that we do not need to be deceived by false doctrine with people wrenching things out of context to make them say things that they don't say. We thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit to uh, guide us, to illuminate us. Uh, thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you have left us in the scriptures so that we can have a much better idea, not only of learning about you, but to see how you operated in time that then provides the pattern for us, such as we were reminded today of your going off to pray before a new aspect of ministry was begun. So we thank you for these truths. Thank you for each person that is gathered here together with us today and those here online from various special places around the world. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Uh, Dean, you had a... Yeah, one of the things... Uh...